So a bit about me, I did my PhD in the University of Edinburgh. I then worked to Toshiba Medical, uh, did some medical vision uh, problems, and now I'm leading the machine learning at AIMBRAIN. And in AIMBRAIN, we, do biomet we have a biometric authentication platform where we deal with uh, behavioral uh, data, we have we deal with face recognition and voice recognition. And, well, you can learn more about us in our website. Uh, well, we all, I mean, we are relevant to machine learning and we all know the development cycle of a machine learning. Uh, we start with a database that we want to uh, classify or do a regression or solve some type of problem. We'll gather and curate the data, we'll create a first model and we'll test it and see how it performs. And then we will iterate the process by tweaking more the parameters of the model, tweaking a bit the features, redoing the model, re doing the whole uh, process of testing until the end of times and when someone tells us now you have to stop because you have to put it in production. Um, so ideally, uh, when we do a new architecture for deep learning, we do the same thing, but the problem is that there are more hyperparameters to tune in a uh, deep learning algorithm because we have more layers, we have more decisions per layer, and the complexity increases with the more number of layers that you introduce. So, well, our, what we want ideally to have is a process that we will give a high-end goal to the algorithm and then the process itself will figure out what is the best model to use in the specific case. Um, so, in a sense, we want to make a model that learns what other models perform like. Uh, so, it might not be used in every, in every situation, but in, in the industry we tend to have a lot of problems that are repetitive in a sense that the input is similar, the output is the same, and it might change from client to client, you want to apply something on their own data. But fundamentally the problem is the same. So you kind of have an idea what networks will work, but you don't know exactly which. So you want to make a process that will automatically do that for you, and you will have more time to do more, stuff, more fun stuff. So, Searching for hyperparameters is not new, right? People have been doing it with uh, grid search or random search. More advanced methods include the uh, tree of Parson estimators, um, uh, Bayesian optimization, or particle swarm optimization. And their goal is generally to map a hyperparameter search space into a reward space and then move accordingly to find the best solution to the problem. Um, there are some pros to these things. So, for example, random and grid search are very easy to implement. It's like a few lines of code. There are plenty of packages out there that can do it. The results are solid. You explore a large number of parameters. Um, and the more advanced methods, they even produce even better results, and they're better at doing that. Uh, but they come with some pitfalls. Some of them is uh, random search and grid search can search very bad spaces into the, sorry, can I use the, sorry, yeah, uh, so random search tends to de devote a lot of resources into the wrong area of the place, uh, of the space, so that means that you're wasting resources doing searches that will yield nothing, and when you move into more complicated approaches like Bayesian optimization, then the cost of doing more intellectual searches comes at the, more intelligent searches comes at the thing that you have to do it sequentially. So sequentially you have to test model by model and then keep improving it. And that is slow, and since we have a lot of computers to use, why not do it distributedly? And the other thing that both of these methods of these approaches struggle is structure. So once you introduce structure into the neural network, then it's even harder to parameterize uh, how would you do that search about the, the search space. Um, to give you an example, a simple random tree, you can parameterize it by giving the hyperparameter that you wanna deal with and what type of, uh, you know, what's the range of the parameters that you wanna try, it can, might be any type of distribution or a list, and then the random search will go about and uh, do its thing. But when it comes to neural networks, then you have more things. Okay, this is an easy example of a neural network because you only have to find how many layers you want and what type of layers. But how would you evolve something like this? 
you see like a very complicated structure of modules being interconnected and being repeated throughout the whole network uh, to get a good classifier. This is, by the way, the Google LedNet, which is a very famous model and very uh, powerful for imaging, in case you want to use it. Um, so we want to redefine the problem into a learning problem, in a sense. And this is the typical reinforcement learning scenario. We have an agent. The agent is the model that we produce. And the agent will take a step into the environment, will train on some data set, will get some results. And once that cycle is done, uh, it will get a reward, like how well it performed into the test set. So usually, you want your agent to make intelligent decisions in terms of exploration, to go to the right areas. And once it finds the good areas, it needs to exploit the area more and find what is the local minimum, uh, the local maximum of, the, of that hyperspace. Um, so in a sense, you need to balance out how you do these two things. And your rewards are sparse, so you don't have a lot of signal from the problem itself. That means that you need to complete a full cycle of training and testing in order to, uh, to evaluate how good you well, how good you did. And uh, that can be not easy to solve, so we haven't solved RL yet. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it's an open problem. Uh, so two common solutions to the RL type of problems that exist out there. Uh, one is modeling uh, Markov decision processes. Um, well, which is a bit of a huge literature. I won't be able to cover any of this this time. Uh, and the other, the other way to solve this uh, RL problem is through evolutionary algorithms. So evolutionary algorithms are inspired by a biological evolution. Uh, they evolve initializing a starting population of solutions, um, uh, which are completely random. And then through the process of selection, crossover, which is breeding and mutation, it will produce good enough uh, models that kind of solve the problem. You cannot guarantee that it will be the, the optimal solution, but they will perform, they will do something that solves the problem. Uh, so why we want to use evolution is basically it's a random search with some heuristic for exploitation. So you have the random exploration part from uh, the randomness of mutation and the diversity that the mutation increase, uh, introduces. And you also have the exploitation of the thing which, is, which comes from the selection part. And, uh, oh, sorry, that's the wrong slide. So the a typical evolution cycle involves initializing a population, uh, which is random solutions. Uh, it needs to define a way that we evaluate the model. In our current uh, scenario is you want to evaluate in a, on a supervised setting. So you train and you test on, the, on some data. Um, then you want to have a selection process, which will tell you, uh, OK, which, which of the solutions that we have in your space are good and how good they are compared to the, to the competitors. Then you have two genetic operators that uh, introduce the diversity in the set, which is the crossover, which, is, uh, which tell us how you combine two parent uh, solutions to create a new one, and then how you mut mutate that solution to create a, a bit different uh, model for that. Once you repeat that and you have a good enough population, then you repeat the process and you evaluate again and you do again crossover and the evolution step and until you find some solution that satisfies your problem. Um, so I will show you how you can go ahead and make a simple implementation with a tournament selection play uh, and a mutation only breeding. Applying crossover into structural problems like neural networks and Blending graphs is a bit more difficult. I will tell, talk about a bit more in the later slides. But for the simple implementation, we only have a tournament selection play, a tournament play selection, and a mutation. So, what we want in our model is we want from our inputs to get it to the outputs, and we add layers. These layers might have uh, different number of layers, different type of layers, different activation functions, and we might even want to have more funky connections, so we want a type to, we want somehow to be able to hold the connectivity of the graph, to, to uh, encode the connectivity of the graph. So an, easiest, an easy way to represent, the natural way to represent it is an 
as it is a directed graph, but instead of the nodes being the processing units, the edges are the processing units, and the nodes are the output tensors of every process. Um, of course, because it's a feed-forward network, some of the connections are not allowed, so we will exclude them, or we won't allow them to happen, or connections that create uh, tensors that are not connected to the outputs will not be allowed, and after we have this description, we can create a graph that will uh, make our computational graph and our neural network. Um, the simple, we have a simple set of mutation rules. Uh, we can either mutate a parameter that regards the optimizer or the layers, and we can also mutate the graph. And the mutations of the graphs, have, graphs are either adding an edge, which is a residual edge, an identity connection, or a convolution, or a fully connected, depends on what type of module you want to build. We can remove a, a graph if it's allowed to do it, uh, or we can split a layer into two layers, so we can add two edges instead of one. And the tournament selection play, it's a common pattern that is used in evolutionary uh, algorithms if you don't want to do any crossover. The tournament selection play will create a tournament with k individuals. These individuals uh, are assigned the probability with the best individual having the highest probability and then the rest split up the rest of the probability, the, the remainder of the probability. And you pick one of them, you sample one of them, you mutate it and you add it back to the tournament to the population, and then you keep evolving, you redo the uh, evolution step. Uh, we start with an initial, initial population, as we said. The initial network just has one layer, and then we sample and mutate, to mutate it once or twice or no mutation, and that's how we start our population. We represent our module in nodes and edges, so we said that before. Uh, we're gonna use Keras and TensorFlow to create the graphs and train them. And the, the simplest way to do it is you traverse the graph. Uh, every time you see a convolution or an, any type of operation, you add it to the graph. You do it breadth first. And if some nodes doesn't satisfy all the incoming nodes, then it will back up and redo the, all the requirements before you go into the node. Um, implementing it in the uh, multi-processing way, it involves uh, creating a coordinator thread that will run our main evolutionary algorithm. That, that thread will hold all the population, the statistics of the population, uh, what are the evolution steps, how you add mutations, and it will spawn the worker threads that will uh, make take the load of the work. Uh, its worker thread is crucial to, it, it needs to take a phenom type, take a genome, uh, make it into a model, train it, save it, and then return the results back to the coordinator thread. And uh, each worker thread has its own uh, TensorFlow session, its own uh, copy of data, and it will, receive, it will keep receiving more uh, networks from the coordinator uh, until all the networks are evaluated and trained and evaluated. Uh, this is how simple it is. You basically want a scheduler that uh, will spawn the workers. It's very important. The, the important part of this, that's what I wanted to show, is this thing. You need to import a TensorFlow session at the beginning of the run session of the worker. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Unless you do it distributedly within TensorFlow. Uh, once the training and testing process is done, the, the results are returned to the coordinator thread that will decide uh, which are selected, which are mutated, how is the crossover happening, and what's happening. So now we have everything in place. Let's see how, how do we, we, we define the network space, we define the mutation rules, we have a selection algorithm, we have our scheduler, our workers, so everything is set and ready to go. Um, so some of the results, this is a very toy example, we run the results, uh, we run a uh, uh, a classification problem on NIST, which we all know the handwritten data set. Uh, so it's images. The first, the first graph will show you the results of an evolutionary process without any mutations on the graph. So that means that you use the traditional techniques that say, I want to sample the layer number, I want to sample what type of uh, every layer, what type of number of units to hold have, the dropouts, and every of the parameters. And you see that it's there is a trend of improving with every epoch. So these are the epochs of the evolution, and these are the and the y-axis is 
the score of the classifiers, and the boxes show the 68% of the classifiers where they stand. So there is a trend that is going upwards that it's improving by epoch. Oh, I have to rush. So if you add structure, you see that the, it's even more tight. The, the, uh, the generated models do even better, and you can see the spread of it. And if you compare it to a completely random search, which most of the models do, that are all over the place, you're wasting resources. So this is a model zoo about what you can do. This is some, so you can easily come up with this, but I don't think someone can come up with this solution. It's fairly complicated and puzzling. Um, so I will skip this part, it's the second part of the talk, which is, I will go a bit forward. It's a work under development. Uh, what you wanna do is you want to represent a network in a sense of a blueprint, and every blueprint will have the concept of module. Modules are networks within the neural network, and they're on their own entities, and they're repeated throughout the network, just like they are done in the uh, Google Lanet. So this is a, a module unit that it's repeated a few times before it reaches the end. Um, if we introduce modules, then we can do cool stuff, like having crossover, because every architecture We'll have a blueprint of, I need five modules, and then you can mix and match which modules you'll pick. So you have two evolution processes happening together. And then you can do even more cool stuff than, for example, you wanna find an algorithm that will deal with multimodal uh, input. So you want to uh, answer questions on images. You would like a module that is trained on images, a module that is trained on text, a, a combinatory module, and a module that produces answers. So your blueprints will tell you which modules you use, and then the modules themselves are evolved as species populations within your, uh, your gene pool. Uh, everything that I do is uploaded on GitHub. Uh, more things will be uploaded soon. I will add TensorFlow distribution and more on the module development. And you can find the information there. There are some useful references. And uh, well, if you are interested in working in deep learning and interesting problems, then join us in Aimbrain. <laughs>